Greetings, greetings, greetings. This is John Arcovio. <clears throat> I serve as an apostle and I welcome you to our Tuesday night class. God bless you, Brother David Clark. Welcome. And we're continuing our teaching on ministering spiritual gifts. It is a uh, course given by Christian International Ministries from Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> we hope today that you're blessed by this teaching. Bless you, Christina Kanzi. Welcome to the class. Thank you, David Clark. Amen. So, um, we're just a little bit early today, about five minutes early. And I'm going to give just a few minutes for everyone to get on. Those of you that are joining us that have your manuals, if you want to turn to section 401, section 401 to begin session four. I'm really excited about teaching this class. Lots of great information, lots of great um, spiritual application. Amen. And um, just looking forward to what God has in store. Our session four, God bless you, thank you. Our session four is going to be covering Christ's commands concerning spiritual gifts. Now, once again, this teaching is more designed for believers. Uh, we teach very strongly that you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. God can, amen, uh, Sister Krog, amen, God bless you, amen. Um, you don't have to be a prophet to prophesy. All nine gifts of the Spirit flow and minister through the body. And so much of this teaching can be applied to the fivefold ministry, but it also is specifically designed to help believers uh, become awakened in their spiritual gifting, aligned through teaching and understanding with the particular spiritual gifting that they that God wants them to flow in, and of course, activated. It takes a senior prophetic ministry, uh, apostolic prophetic ministry, to activate believers into their callings. Now, again, we covered a few weeks ago the distinction of the different gifts. You have the five, uh, the fivefold ministry gifts, so the five um, ascension gifts that God has given to the church. That lead those leadership gifts that are. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and the main function of the leadership gifts is to work together as a team to train, equip, and release believers into their prophetic destiny. Then you have your nine gifts of the Spirit, which are broken into your power gifts, your speaking gifts, and your knowing gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, discerning the spirits, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, excuse me, I already spoke that, but um, gift of faith, uh, working of miracles, healing. And these nine gifts of spirit are what we are particularly referring to when we say in this teaching, Christ's commands concerning spiritual gifts. Then, of course, you have these seven administrative gifts that are there for edifying and building up the ecclesia. And that's your gifts of service and leadership, of compassion, and, and, and those different things. So let's go ahead and jump into it. And, and get going here. Amen. And again, if you want to follow on your manual, we're starting on section 401, session 4, Christ's commands concerning spiritual gifts. 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Paul said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, we discussed several weeks ago how we need to learn to not so much depend on feelings and um, things of this nature, but we need to learn to depend upon the Word. If you want a manual, you need to go to www.spiritled.net. That's spiritled.net, just like it's spelled on my shirt here. Click on digital downloads, and then you can choose to order a manual online. It'll be shipped to you within a few days. <clears throat> Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, first of all, gifts are 
uh, awakened or activated by senior ministries. And Paul, being a senior apostle, laid hands upon young Timothy at that time as an upcoming apprentice growing apostle. And by the putting on of his hands, he released or activated the gift of God within uh, the apostle Timothy. Now, let me pause here and again say um, that because you operate in the gift of prophecy, that doesn't make you a prophet. Nor if you do the works of an, of an apostle, as far as just the works are concerned, that doesn't necessarily mean you're an apostle. You know, you can operate as a believer in the gift of prophecy, and that is a very important gift and a very substantial ministry, but it does not necessarily make you an apostle, a prophet. And um, continuing you know, on with the same concept in all the fivefold ministry, pastor, evangelist, teacher, such and such. So it's important to understand this from the beginning. But I will say that the apostle does operate by the gift of God, the gift of apostle. The prophet operates by the gift of the prophet, on and on. But this, the gift of God that was upon Timothy was stirred up. And of course, he I mean, was, was um, placed upon him or activated, but it was up to Timothy to stir up that gift. That's by choice. Now, we can also stir the gift up through prayer and fasting and obedience to the word of God. But, you know, we should learn to simply operate by faith in our gift and obedience to God given us the gift and understanding we are a good steward of the gift. Many of the most mighty miracles I've seen in my life in ministry over the past 30 years happen in settings where I stirred the gift. Well, what do you mean, Brother Arcovio? There was a need present. Someone came forth. I stepped forth, didn't necessarily feel anything, didn't feel any electricity or power. I just, by faith, laid hands upon them and prayed the prayer of faith or spoke a word of faith over them and a miracle took place. Your healing is not in a feeling. Your healing is in faith in God's word. So the purpose of this session is to share the nine commands from the word, to build a solid biblical foundation and to con convince and motivate every believer that is God's will for you to function in the gifts. Let me pause here and say that every believer has the ability, not the ability, but the opportunity to operate in all nine gifts. But each gift has to be activated in your life through teaching, through laying on of hands, through reason of use, through exercising, and as well as the choice of God. But I do believe every believer can operate in all nine gifts of the Spirit. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later on. To encourage them to be doers of the word. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. He teaches us so that we will believe and do. It's not enough just to believe, but we must believe and do. And not just be hearers only. I've said for years... Don't invite me to a prophetic conference to talk about prophecy. I'm going to prophesy. Don't invite me to a healing ministry to talk about these different things and different aspects. If I'm going to be in a, a, an atmosphere where we're going to speak about the gifts and the operation of the Spirit, there's also going to be demonstration and not just talking about it. We must believe and do. To cover nine directives to build faith in the hearts of the saints. Stirring up boldness to act and thereby experiencing God's grace shed upon all who walk in obedience. And that's just it. When you step up by faith and you walk in obedience as a good steward of your gift, that enacts the grace of God. That's why I tell people there's no reason to be proud for a gift. You did nothing to gain that gift. Gifts are just that. They are given by the grace of God. And so if you have a very powerful gift in your life of prophetic utterance or apostolic function, you're only going to hurt yourself by thinking you're somebody because of that or elevating yourself in your mind above others. And, and, and God's really not pleased with that because gifting is just that. It's giftings from God. To reveal apostolic prophetic patterns and principles currently emerging in the church that edify and build up the body of Christ and to bring the church or the ecclesia into the Ephesians 4 and 16 ideal, which is the perfecting of the saints and the work of ministry and God 
building up and keeping the people of God from being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and 31, and he repeated it in 14 and 39, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Yet I show to you a more excellent way. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. You might ask, well, what are the best gifts? Gloria a Dios from Chile. What are the best gifts? The best gifts are the gifts that are needed at the moment. Amen. That's why it's important for a believer to become equipped and familiar with all nine gifts because you never know what gift is needed at what moment. Now, the word covet is a very strong word. To covet means to have a tremendous passion and zeal. I can tell you that throughout the years, God has always given me, even from a young man, a great passion and zeal for the gifts of the Spirit. And there's nothing wrong with that. I thank God when men and women come to me and they have that gleam in their eye and they really want to learn and know about the gifts of the Spirit because Paul instructed us to covet. So to covet means a burning and yearning to be used. Beloved, God wants to use you more than you want to be used. You gotta understand that. That's why he's designed trials. I was talking with a prophet this week and she was sharing with me how she, uh, the Lord had spoken to her the, uh, the, the concept of the deeper the trial, the greater the trial, the greater the, 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 the blessing or the anointing. And if God sends you in a very deep, dark trial that just shatters you and shakes you, you can have hope and know that if you pass the test, and that's the key, you've got to allow yourself to become purged and purified and pass the test. And when you pass the test, a greater victory is waiting for you. And that's really been my focus in the past, you know, a trial I've been facing for about seven years. God just let me pass the test. Let me develop the character that you desire and help me to pass each and every test that comes my way. The Greek word for covet earnestly in the Greek uh, original language is zelou. Zelou means to have great desire for, to be jealous over, and to be zealously affected. The root word is zelos. The word zelos means fervency of mind, hot, an emotional jealousy, such as a husband that truly loves his wife should have over her. Amen. In a, it is a word relating to the positive, sanctified, desire-driven force that will make the believer move beyond human reason and selfish pride. You see, one thing about um, many prophets is many prophets, if they will go to a psych psychologist or someone who has studied the emotions and mind, they would describe them as having, and they would give certain terms to it, but really the descri description of it is where in your prefrontal cortex, the two lobes here, the normal brain, if you looked at it under a scan, it's smooth, it's, it's full. And that's the filter that causes people to, to be cautious about saying things and to have diplomacy and discretion. Many prophets, uh, one of the things that, that they battle in life is a, is a dichotomy. And that is that prefrontal cortex, if you took a, a picture of it on a brain, it, it's what's called the Swiss cheese effect, where uh, I had a scan of my brain and the two prefrontal cortexes were not smooth. They actually looked like parts of Swiss cheese. They had holes in it. And what that means is that you don't have a filter sometimes that many people have. So you end up saying things that only people think. And you, you can be very blunt and very bold. And that can be a, uh, a weakness when it comes to social skills in life. And I, I know throughout the years, I've had ministers I was close to, they would laugh at me and say, Brother Arcovio, you say out loud what people think. Well, in my mind is thinking it and saying it, there's no difference. But a lot of people, they're able to hide behind their thoughts 
and be diplomatic and they seem to be so just so nice and so kind and but it's because they have a fully functioning pre prefrontal cortex but the problem is when you start trying to move in the gifts of the spirit that propensity that the human mind and the human nature has to reason things out and to not do certain things because of selfish pride, because you don't want to stick your neck out there, you don't want to take a chance, you don't want your reputation, it actually becomes a hindrance to you. So what can be a weakness socially to men and women, sometimes God uses men and women that have that condition, because without the filter, they're much more easy, much more um, able to flow and speak just simply what thus saith the Lord. And I know many times I've spoken things in the spirit that after the service, I would sit in my hotel room and think, my Lord, what did I say tonight? Because it was so out there. But um, it is part of uh, the factors where I've known a lot of prophetic ministries that were gifted in prophecy. They would have conditions that that many, many psychologists would put um, certain acronyms on it, such as ADHD, ADD, and all these different acronyms. So anyway, it's just a little side point there. But the connotation of, of zeal, passionate zeal, is one of a compelling force that causes the believer to undertake a leap of faith into the spirit realm in order to bless others. Regardless of circumstances, and out of one's comfort zone. You're never going to be used much in God if that comfort zone in your life is of great importance to you. You have to be willing to step outside the comfort zone. And the illustration in the Bible where Peter was willing to step out the boat to walk on the water. Now, human reasoning would tell you you don't walk on water, especially during a, a storm where they're in fear of their life. These were hardened fishermen. They were used to being out on the water. But it was such a storm, they were afraid. But I believe Peter <laughs> didn't reason it out. When Jesus said, step out of the boat, he just stepped out and started walking on the water. That's the kind of, of obedient, immediate faith that is required to experience the depths of the supernatural, to be able to speak prophetic words and be used of God. Now, of course, it doesn't mean you just step out and just speak whatever and you're just out of control. The spirit of a prophet is always subject to the prophet. That means you are always in control in the Holy Ghost of what you say and do. And you can't just use the excuse that so many of the um, people in the world use. For instance, they'll go out and party and nightclub and they'll drink and get drunk and then they act like, well, I can't remember what I did last night. I'm not responsible because I was drunk. And that same concept tries to slip into the church where people say, well, I was under the power of the Spirit. I have no idea what I was doing. I'm not responsible. No, you are, you are required of God, no matter how heavy the anointing is on you, no matter how out of control you may feel, to be in control of your gift at all times and to operate in decency and order. But also, you've got to do. And it's a balance and it takes a real skill and that's why when you come across somebody who is a very, very skilled minister that's able to walk that tightrope and be daring and be dangerous, but also never cross the line and do things that are out of order, that's of great value. That doesn't come overnight. You got to be crushed. It takes a lot of prayer, a lot of fasting, and a lot of breaking to be able to find that balance in the spirit realm. And that's why we don't have very many very mature prophets running around, you know, because it just takes a lot of years for a true seasoned elder prophet that is, is um, recognized and respected for his balance to reach that place. So, understand again, it is the only spiritual blessing in the Bible we're told to covet. You cannot find any other place where the scriptures tell you to passionately desire for something. But it does say to covet earnestly the best gifts. So it's okay. That's why I don't understand when people uh, in the Christian world uh, try to minimize and try to even uh, you know, discourage people from seeking the gifts. 
they're actually fighting against what the Bible commands us to do. Amen. So there is strong instruction and encouragement in the Word of God to move in the gifts of the Spirit as we are growing and maturing in Christ. And it's important that you have a well-rounded ministry. That as, that as you not only begin to flow and grow in the gifts, that you also flow and grow in the character and the fruit of the Spirit. Because there's some power God can't trust you with unless you have His character. He's not going to give you that power if you don't demonstrate His character. So, this process works simultaneously. You grow both spiritually and in character. You grow both spiritually in the gifts and in the fruit. Human reasoning says, well, I must be mature first. I must be professional and accomplished and then operate. But really, no, God will allow you to operate as you grow. He's not going to wait for you to be perfect. But, he, but the thing is, the great gifts, the heavy gifts, the big guns, God will hold back until you have the character. But he'll use you. Amen. Where you're at. So the gifts, again, are not designed to benefit us directly. And you must understand that. Now, does a seasoned minister live by the gospel? That is biblical. There's a lot of voices out there today that try to convince you that men and women of God should not receive anything from ministry. And that's not biblical. The Bible says don't muzzle the, the, mouth, the, the mouth of the ox. You know, if an ox is treading in the corn, he's worthy to, to partake of his labor. And Paul also said, you know, treat them of the gospel and those that operate in the, in the spirit with honor and double honor. And it's very indicative in the word of God, especially in the later years, that Paul received uh, uh, sustenance for his ministry. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what destroys it is excesses. And this happens many times within pastoral ministries where pastors begin to uh, enjoy great, great financial blessings and, and, and they control the finances. And so they look around and there's other pastors living certain lifestyles and so they begin to get more and more extravagant. And what I've discovered in ministry is entitlement will destroy you. If you start trying to live with the concept of entitlement that because you've had X amount of years in ministry, you deserve that $4 million home because you're ministry has impacted so many thousands of people that gather together to worship in one place that you deserve to drive that $150,000 car, then you know what? It's time to go back to Calvary. And not only that, I wish I could take you with me to India and start seeing some of the ministries overseas that suffer greatly for the cause of Christ. It may change you. As long as you stay comfortable in America, just, just, just going, and um, comparing yourself amongst yourself, then you hurt people. Then there's people that are bitter and they don't want to bless the ministry. There's gotta be a balance, but don't be afraid to bless the man of God. Don't be afraid to sow seed into a man of God's ministry, especially if God tells you to. Especially if it's a man of God that's living by faith from the gospel, amen. So, having said this, again, the gift is not designed to benefit us directly. The nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the benefit of others. 1 Corinthians 14 and 4 says, He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesieth edifies the church. Now, the, expression, the explanation of that is not the, uh, the, the gift of tongues or, or, or diverse types of tongues, which is an operation of the gifts of the Spirit. This is when you pray in the Holy Ghost to build up your most holy faith. I pray in the Holy Ghost every day, all day long, I pray in the Holy Ghost. Because um, um, it, it really um, strengthens your spirit. Amen. Praise God. So it takes unselfish, dedicated, humble Christians who are willing to be used in the gifts. We are to manifest the attitudes of the heart that says, I want to be a blessing and a servant to others. And, and, and that's got to be the, the uh, driving force, the driving motivation for ministry. It's not to be someone great. It's not to gain, gain great things. Though, yes, you, you, know, you may reach a place that God may choose to allow you to live by the gospel. But both Matthew 23 and 11, as well as Mark 9 and 35, tell us that we have to manifest the attitude of the heart that says, 
I want to be a blessing to others and a servant to others. The only gift for our personal edification and comfort is the believer's prayer and praise language that comes with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I already said that. Jude 20 says, But beloved, building up, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 14, 14-15 tells us, for, I pray, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. So we've got to desire spiritual gifts. And the Lord commands us to covet the gifts of the Spirit, and he's eagerly willing to supply faith and grace needed for the operation of these gifts. As he yearns for man's salvation, so he longs for his church to expectantly and eagerly and perpetually desire the gifts that he's given and given and given. To follow after love is the manifest, mature, Christ-like character and the greatest command that Paul explains to us in 1 Corinthians 13. It is the measuring stick of success of the heart that is united to Christ. And again, desire is the same Greek word here that talks about the desire or follow after love. It's zilu, to be earnestly passionate about it. So desire is a scriptural key to receiving from God. Desire. You must desire it. God's not going to bless you with giftings if you don't desire it. You must earnestly pray for and seek after it. That's why Jesus said in Mark 11 and 24, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, why is it important that prayer is sandwiched in there? Why didn't Jesus just say, whatsoever things you desire, believe? Now, some people do that. They skip over what the Bible instructs us and they think, I'll just name it and claim it. I'll just blab it and grab it. I just got to have faith and I'm going to get it. So I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe for this. And they start just listing off all the things they want to believe for. Like, like God's just some Santa Claus God that's going to come down with a big old sack and just give them whatever they want. No. The reason why prayer, and this isn't just now a laying me down to sleep prayer. This is submitting your spirit to God in prayer. Because when you pray, that's how we come into alignment with God's mind, with God's purposes. And you can start off wanting something, but when you pray, God can shift your desires to become what he wants. And it's a beautiful thing when a child of God reaches a place of maturity that he's no longer trying to tell God to give him what he wants or tell God to do things the way he or she wants it to be done. But rather, you pray the will of God. Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. God, if it's your will for this to happen, let it come to pass. If it's your will for this to be accomplished, let it be accomplished. That's how you sort through and reach the point that when you pray and you leave that prayer time, you can believe that you receive because you've heard from God and you will have them. Amen. God wants fruitfulness in our life. It is the will of God for us to be fruitful. John 15, I've been preaching a lot this month from John 15. John 15 is a powerful passage about abiding in Him and being fruitful and not just having fruit, but the fruit remaining. So Jesus gives us four keys to bringing forth things in the spirit realm. First, he says, desire. You must desire them. Again, the Greek word for desire here is aito, which means to crave, to desire, to beg. It doesn't just mean you're casual. Okay, God, well, if you move, great. If you don't move, it's fine. You know, people are so flippant. No, you got to get down and say, God, I want to be used by you. God, whatever it takes, break me, crush me, mold me, purify me, because I want to be a vessel fit for the master's use. Because my friend, if you're going to be used by God in this last hour, it's going to be because you desire it, not just pa passively, but passionately. Then pray. You begin by desiring, but then you continue by praying. The Greek word here for pray in Mark 11 and 24 is prosiuch, which means to communicate, to commune with, to fellowship his presence, 
to talk to the Lord. Now, there are times that I'm very passionate in prayer and I'm very burdened. That's usually intercession prayer. Most times when I'm talking to God, I'm just sharing my heart. Many times I just pull my heart out to God. I'm weeping and I'm just saying, God, I want to be the man of God you want me to be. God, I want to be more like you. God, I want to do your will. God, you know, it's just talking to God. And then talking to God very plainly about your life. Amen. It's not some oratory, you know, oh, God of the heavens that has flung the, you know, when I see someone praying like that, I'm like, get a life. When you talk to God, it's just, it's just talk to God. Just commune with him. Then the word believe. The word believe in Mark 11 and 24, it, it, the Greek word believe is pistio, which means to put one's trust in. What are you fussing about and what are you concerned about that you need to put your trust in God and just believe? And then finally, after you've desired, you've prayed, you've believed, believed, and the Bible says you shall have. The Greek word for have is isomia, which means to have it. It will come to pass. It will be. When you get up from that prayer time and that confidence is in your heart, let your words profess it. You know, I, right now I'm believing God to sell this house that I'm in. I've got it on the market. I'm believing God and a prophet spoke to me this week and said, you're going to get your asking price. I claim that. And I want to discipline myself no matter how exhausted or tired I get in the process. I believe I will have it as according to God's word. Amen. So the first step is to see a manifestation of God's power, of his presence or provision the first step to seeing this is to have a heart attitude that craves something godly. If you want to see the manifestation of God's power in your life, the manifestation of his presence or provision, then crave, covet godly things. Another principle is you can allow the trials of life to make your heart soft and pliable. That's one thing since January God keeps coming back to me because I'm, I'm in transition. God's transitioning me into new dimensions, new networks, new ministries. And I'm having to let a very rigid mindset that I had for many, many years that my heart to become soft and pliable in the hands of God to embrace these new wineskins of ministry that he's bringing to me. In Psalms 37 and 4, David said, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thy heart. God knows what you desire, beloved. Delight yourself in him. Be, be, be just anxious to get into his presence and to pray and to get into his word. And become soft and pliable so you can receive the new one skins of the spirit. Too many people in this hour are too rigid in, in their thinking with ministry. And they must become pliable to receive the new wine skins of what God is doing especially with raising the ecclesia, the believers, the perfect generation, to conquer the seven mountains of society. These are all new wineskin concepts that we've got to open up to receive. Amen. Delight in the Hebrew here, it's anag. Anag means to be soft and pliable. David reveals that as the believer is soft and pliable in the hands of God, the Lord will implant his desires. You see, when you go through trials and people disappoint you, friends disappoint you, family disappoints you, spouses disappoint you, you become disappointed because things aren't happening, your faith becomes weary because things aren't working out like you thought it would, it's the enemy's duty to try to make you harsh and hard-hearted and calloused. But you've got to work at remaining soft and pliable in the hands of God. His cravings and his yearnings, he will implant into your heart and mind. As every saint of God allows God's word to wash them, and that's in Ephesians 5 and 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of the water by the word. Then they become a pliable vessel in his hands developing an intense desire or craving for the gifts of the Spirit to serve effectively. When I see ministry and people that are harsh and against the gifts, most usually it's they're very rigid, they're not pliable, and they're stuck on rules of God that were 50 years old, 100 years old, and they're 
still stuck in old wineskins. We must desire to and to covet. Now, to desire to and to covet are logos, or written commands. Therefore, full right and authority is given to want, expect, and do the word, the logos. The apostolic prophetic pattern is to bring change, to blow away the ashes of everything that is false and religious, traditions of men, and religiosity of pharisaical spirits and attitudes, and to raise the dead and obsolete traditions of men, which hinders the ecclesia from maturing and release the ecclesia or the church into the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's what Ephesians 4 and 13 tells us. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. It is God's restoration move to establish and build on the true foundation of what Ephesians 2 and 20 says, and that's the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the true cornerstone, the chief cornerstone. The apostolic prophetic restoration move of God cannot just be a bolted function on the existing traditional church like a room addition. You know, a lot of people like, hey, Brother Arcobio, come and teach our people on apostolic prophetic. And I'm like, you know, if you don't understand the foundational principles, if you're not willing to endure the sacrifice and the pain of change, you can't just bolt what I'm teaching to the existing democratic structure that the traditional church is in. Because the existing democratic structure that is completely dominated by parliamentary procedure, majority vote, boards, things of this nature, all they have to do is say, we don't want this, and it's over. No, if you want true apostolic prophetic revival to sweep your life, whatever ministry you're in, You've got to let God completely strip you down to nothing and rebuild you on the foundation of true apostolic prophetic functions and principles. And that is the fivefold ministry with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So you've got to blow the ashes away. Blow away all the chaff of tradition. Now that's hard. Some folks can't do it. Some folks don't want to pay the price for that. And that's fine. They can continue on doing what they're doing. I don't criticize them. But you cannot just bolt onto the existing traditional church mindset. you got to come in and allow yourself to be completely restructured to the whole scriptural foundations of apostolic prophetic understanding and teaching. The church that is coming forth is a vital growing entity in this hour. And this church, this ecclesia, must remain soft, sensitive and humble, and pliable. And that means to hear and to bow quickly to what God is demanding for change and to move swiftly when God says move to the commands that God is speaking. Not only through Logos revealed, but Rhema. He, Jesus, is the head of the body. Not the pastor, Jesus is. Amen. So stir up your spiritual gift. 2 Timothy 1 and 6 again says, Wherefore I put into thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. It is the believer's responsibility to stir up the gifts that God has given them. Amen. See, the man of God can activate you and release his gifts in your life, but you must stir them up. Paul's admonition to young Timothy makes it clear that this is Timothy's responsibility. And he must do so by purposeful and premeditated meditated action. That's what we call activation. Purposeful and premeditated action. The word stir up in the Greek is anazopuro. Anazopuro means to rekindle or to arouse from dormancy. It means it's already there, 
But something has caused your gift to go into dormancy. It might have been persecution from other believers. It might have been correction, erroneously, from some Bible ministry leader, rebuke, someone telling you it's not your place to prophesy or do this, which is unbiblical. Or it may just be your pride and you're wanting to be in control and to live in a comfort zone. You must stir it up. Paul, in 1 Timothy 4 and 14, admonished Timothy to not neglect the gift that was in thee. So it would seem that because Paul had warned Timothy, maybe Timothy didn't listen. Maybe Timothy was under pressure from family or other ministries that didn't believe in what Paul was preaching. But for whatever reason, Paul had to come back in his second letter, letter and he had to charge Timothy. Timothy, son, you got to stir that gift back up again. you got to stir it up. See, stirring a gift is based on the individual's will. The believer does not have to wait on the Holy Spirit unction for this. Don't wait for chills and goosebumps and getting moved by God. But it's an act of human will. You can arouse the gift from a state of dormancy. Now, it takes faith. And it also takes being, being spirit-led. But by the act of human will, you activate your spiritual praise, praise language. That is always the kickstarter for all the other gifts. Praying in tongues is the kickstarter for all of the gifts of the Spirit that are in play. Amen? So you must pray in tongues first. James 1 and 22 says, Be doers of the word and not just hearers always deceiving your own selves. James 2, 17 to 20 also says, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou dost well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead, being alone? Amen. So for faith to be exercised, you've got to stir up the gift. Amen. Paul stated in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 to 15, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is fruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the spirit, but I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So this is saying there's a time and place for everything. There's a time for everyone to join together in celebration time and to sing a song that everyone knows the words. There's a time for you to pray in tongues and sing in tongues. Unknown language. Amen. Now when you're praying, in the, when you're, when you're praying and singing in the understanding, everybody's being blessed. When you're praying in tongues or singing in tongues, many times that's strengthening your own soul and your human spirit, which is infused by the Holy Spirit. The operations of the gifts of God are not based upon feeling. Now, this is something that is so important because we're such creatures of emotion, especially if you grew up in certain Pentecostal circles, you didn't do anything without feeling. In fact, you had to have that feeling. If you didn't feel God, you feel like, where's God at? You know, you may be in, beloved, a, a period of time right now that God is trying to teach you to walk by faith and trust his word, both Logos and Rhema, and not depend so much on feeling. Amen. So the operation of the gifts of God are not based upon feeling, but upon the will of the individuals to believe the scriptures and yield to the Spirit of God. Let me say that again. It's based upon the will of the individual to believe the Scriptures and to yield to the Spirit of God. It does not require goosebumps. It doesn't require funny feelings. It does not require being moved by the Spirit or feeling some other manifestation. It simply requires action by faith. Here's an example. Salvation is based upon our will and his will. What do you mean by that? For it is God's will that all men come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's also the Lord's will that every believer rekindle, activate, and stir up their gifts of the Spirit. 
Every single one of you, when you, when you received the Holy Spirit and spoke in spoken tongues the first time, you had to speak those words out. God did not take your tongue and force you to speak in tongues. You had to, by faith, believe that those stammering lips and what's going on, that when you begin to speak those words, that it didn't make sense that that was the Holy Spirit speaking through you. But it began by an act of your willingness to obey God. So how were the gifts stirred up? The first thing Apostle Paul did with the new spirit for believers was to activate them in the gifts. The Corinthian church was carnal, selfish, and fleshly, and babes in Christ. Now this is not saying that you frustrate God's grace by being carnal, selfish, and fleshly always. No, you've got to grow. But God's not going to wait for you to be perfectly mature. And Paul did not wait for the Corinthian church to be perfect. He corrected them by his letters, but he also activated them in their giftings to his teachings. The apostolic pattern says, let us learn afresh and then put all into the right operating systems so it doesn't go astray. You teach, you train, and you activate just as you want would a young child, giving broad perimeters, enabling movement forward and the ability to go into higher levels. Exercise and growth go hand in hand to mature somebody. But you've got to exercise the giftings and give room for mistakes and then have a spirit of, of, of gentleness and willingness to gently as a father pull some aside to train them and help them to grow in their giftings. So, first of all, be convinced it's the Lord's will to manifest his gifts. Number two, be persuaded that every believer has at least one of the nine gifts. Eventually you'll operate in all nine, but there's at least one right now that God will activate in your life, no matter where you're at. Number three, realize that no believer is perfect or is expected to be without mistakes because we we'll all make mistakes. I've been operating in the apostolic prophetic for 30 years. I still make mistakes. <laughs> shock, shock. Amen. Number four, comprehend. We learn by doing. Exercise is imperative. That's the key word here, beloved. Exercise. Exercise your gifts. Just operate. Minister every day. Find opportunities to, 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 to exercise your giftings. Amen. Number five, pray in the spirit. That's praying in tongues. It's a privilege and a catalyst to receiving the mind of Christ. You know, there's people that call me and say, you know, with Arcobio, I've been praying and I feel like God spoke to me. I, I want a confirmation from God. And right there, I may not feel a word from God. But I'll say, let's pray. And I'll begin to pray in tongues with them on the phone. And many times, boom, the gift is stirred and I begin to speak prophetic words to them. Amen. Switch on his power source that our human spirit can receive thoughts, impressions, pictures, etc., from the Holy Spirit. This is a marvelous guard against the pride of man in his own abilities. And that's knowing that you got to pray in tongues and allow God to flow through you. We need to go to him in humble obedience of faith, praying and seeking his wisdom and ways and everything that we do. Number six, activation by faith. Stirring up the gift is the saint's responsibility. Gifts are given, number seven. When gifts are given, then fruit is grown. It's not begging. It's not fasting or pleading, God, give me a gift. I did that. I remember one time I, I decided to fast seven days for the nine gifts of the Spirit. I think I was on the third set of seven days of fasting from God. Oh, God, please, God, please. I go to church and pray. Oh, God, I want the gifts. God, let the gifts come upon me. And God stopped me and rebuked me. And this, this was more than 25 years ago when this happened. And he said, my son, quit fasting and praying for my gifts. My gifts are just that. They're a gift. They're inherent in my Holy Spirit. If you want to fast and pray, fast and pray to draw closer to me. To purify your flesh and allow the fruit of the Spirit to flow. Well, that was 30 years ago. And I'm still fasting and praying for certain fruit. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen out there? Amen. Amen. So gifts are given. They're gifts. Fruit is grown. Again, it's not begging. It's not fasting. It's not pleading. It's a gift to be plugged into 
and a gift to be poured out. But beloved, listen to me. If you have a gift and you're sitting on it, I'm sorry if you're in a church or if you're in a, uh, God bless you, New Jersey, amen. If you're in an environment that someone's got their, their thumb on you and keeping you down and you can't operate, you've got to pray and ask God to move you so you can step out in your gift. Don't sit there and quench your gift out of fear. Ask God to put you in an environment that your gift can flow. Amen. Because your gift is there to be poured out. And you are a steward of your gift. You're responsible for your gift. And, and beloved, if you don't use your giftings, you'll have to answer to God one day. There are far too many dominating, manipulating, and controlling church environments that are not of God. That God is releasing His sheep out of those controlling, manipulating, dominating shepherds' grasp and putting them into environments where their giftings can be awakened, aligned, and activated. An example is in 2 Samuel 5 and 24 in the Old Testament. And let it be, and this was God speaking to David, divine strategy for war, let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, I'm going to give you one chance, whoever just says something about hair before I block you. You put something else up there, it's crazy. I'm sorry, I have to block you. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that thou, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the Philistines. Now notice this in this passage in 2 Samuel 5 and 24. Bestir in the Hebrew is sharats which means to be alert, to decide, and to point sharply. Think of this. I must be like David, alert. The New Testament says to be sober. I must decide beforehand, committed within to be obedient, trusting in our mighty God. And I must point sharply to do the thing appointed unto me and to do what God has called me. This is very similar to being pricked with something sharp as if to awaken you, to arouse you to full alertness. Amen. This is what we must decide to do to be used of God. So David inquired of the Lord about the Philistines and was given specific instructions, a divine warfare strategy by the Lord, and he was commanded to let it be or to bestir himself. And David, by his will, obeyed what God said and went. And when he heard the sound of the going in the tops of the mulberry trees, he stirred himself and smote the enemy and won. Likewise, we are commanded by Scripture to stir up the gifts. By obedience, we will reap the benefit of seeing the gifts of the Spirit manifest in our life and many people blessed. Whether you realize it or not, every day of your life, God will stir you. He'll move on you to speak to that person at the coffee shop. He'll move on you. Just, you've got to be willing to obey God and step out by faith to be used of God because there are opportunities every day to exercise your gifting in the seven mountains of society and to be used of God to see these mountains influenced. Amen. So I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Are you all ready? All right. I want you to repeat this prayer. The supernatural is who I am in Christ. All right, that's good. Now repeat this. It is my spiritual DNA birthed in me when I was born again of the Spirit. Now let's repeat together what 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Okay, that's good. Now here's the last thing I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? The kingdom is here when I step in a room. For the kingdom is within me. Now don't you repeat that. The kingdom is here when I step into a room for 
but the kingdom is within me. You see, you are called to bring spiritual displacement. You are called to go into spiritually dark places and through the kingdom of God and the power of God that's within you to displace the authority of hell through your obedience of flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit can be a powerful weapon against the kingdom of hell. And that's why the believers have got to be mobilized to go forth and to impact the seven mountains of society through gifted ministry. I was recently ministering at a place and I was talking about how the greatest works of God are going to happen outside the four walls of a church. And of course, bless that dear pastor because after I ministered that night, he got up and his interpretation of doing that was, okay, everybody here in this building, lay hands on each other and do what our Kogo said and pray for each other and let the gifts flow through you. That's wonderful, but I doubt very seriously he followed it up with saying, okay, I want all of you to go out into the community this next week and operate in these giftings. That's where the rubber meets the road. Because the greatest revival is going to happen amongst the seven mountains of society, outside the four wall of local churches, in the mountains of business and government, in the mountains of arts and entertainment and media, in the mountains of, of, of religious order, as well as family and education. Amen. Praise God. So we exercise our gifts by use. Hebrews 5 and 14 tells us that. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who are by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's how you become spiritually strong. You've got to have your senses exercised to discern what is good and what is evil. So, it's by reason of use that believers develop their spiritual senses. It is only by repeated use that we learn to discern and perceive in the spiritual kingdom and grow to a place of full flow and manifestation of gifting. Just as one visits a gymnasium, that one visit you make doesn't make you a Mr. Universe. So development takes continual, dedicated, and directed workouts. Every year in January, people turn a new leaf. That's when most exercise gyms get their most signups. And that's why when you pass all these exercise gyms and workout places, they have all the banners out in December for all the specials because they know there's going to be a certain amount of people that's going to join the gym in January. But by the end of January, they're done. You can't start in a gifting and then allow persecution and people that come against you and people that mock you and ridicule you or to stop you. You have to persevere to continue exercising your gifts on a daily basis. Hebrews 5 and 14 says, discernment is developed through use, not just preaching and teaching. You have to demonstrate to have discernment. Foundational prophetic ministry operating in a high degree speaks from a future perspective to the present. So what you do as a prophet is, if you're operating prophetically, is you're seeing so far in the future that you're literally reaching out and grabbing the future and you're bringing it to the present. That's why people think you're crazy. That you, you fell off your, the turnip wagon. Amen. But you've got to learn how to build something valid so that the ecclesia will be advanced forward with that prophetic ministry. Prophecy is a tool to build and cause migration from where you are at presently to where God has you in the future. You literally have to see a place in the future that's better. Lock into that place in the future and begin moving towards that place for prophetic fulfillment to come to pass. That's the toughest thing. Because as a prophet and prophetic believer, God will show you things that are not yet show you great and powerful things, and you have to endure the valley and the place you are now as you migrate towards that prophetic picture of your future of what God is going to make you and how you're going to move to that higher level. Prophetic ministry speaks into core issues and shakes complacency in the church. Our ability to hear God's voice has eternal consequences. Malachi 3, 16-18 declares that the saints of God will return 
and discern between the righteous and the wicked and between him that serveth God and him that serveth not. I don't know if you realize that, but God is going to use the saints of God to judge the earth. Every spirit-filled believer has the gifts that you must exercise. Cultivating spiritual discernment, which will be an integral part of ruling and reigning with Christ to eternity. Everything you're developing now in the gifts, every obedience you step out, even in the, in the fivefold ministry leaders, you will use these gifts for eternity. Whatever gift you're flowing in now, you will flow in them for eternity. This is just a dress rehearsal for what's really about to come. Because we will rule and reign with him as kings and princes. And when a thousand years of peace are over, and New Jerusalem is lowered somewhere fixated between the heavens and the earth, and is a new earth and a new seas, we will be in our immortal bodies and we will time travel from the new heavens to the new earth to rule and reign with him for eternity. Amen. Support of that is Revelations 5 and 10, Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 22, as well as 2 Timothy 2 and verse 12. The parables of stewardship reveal our individual responsibilities. In Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, Jesus shares a parable of stewardship emphasizing the responsibility to use what the master imparts. Beloved, you are responsible for your gifting. When you stand before God at Bema, when I stand before God, I can't say, oh God, I wanted to be an apostle, I wanted to operate as a prophet, I wanted to obey you, but, you know, they made fun of me. But I got kicked out of their circles. I've told you before, when man draws a circle of religion, and you don't play by their rules and they kick you out, God draws a bigger circle called the kingdom. And you find yourself in the ocean waters of the kingdom of God. But you can't stand before God on that day and say, but God, I, would, I wanted to, but I would have lost too much. No man that's not willing to forsake mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, children for the sake of the kingdom, then you're not worthy to carry that mantle of anointing. You've got to be willing to obey God and do his will. Amen. And I think I can stand here with the testimony of willingness to sacrifice anything for something greater in God. And it's not easy. It is a, there's a price to pay, my friend. There is a price to pay for something greater in God. But it's worth it for the eternal reward that he gives us. So the parables of stewardship reveal our individual responsibilities to be a steward of our gift. Let's look at it in Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Jesus shares a parable of stewardship, emphasizing the responsibility to use what the master imparts. Good stewards are accountable once they hear truth. That's why some of you that's on here on Periscope, I fear, I fear, I fear for you. You're hearing truth. You're hearing present revealed truth. And if you walk away from it, and you go back to your religious religiosity and your religious circle and order, you're, you're not going to be able to say to God on that day, I didn't know. Because this apostle taught you and told you what you had to do. It's up to you to obey God. Amen. So, the Bible states in this parable that a man traveling into a far country, which represents Christ, called his servants, which represents the saints, and gave unto them his goods. And this was symbolic of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. As the parable progresses, we see that the master's servants are given talents according to their abilities. One servant is given five talents, one is given two, and the last is given one talent. The first two servants use what they have been given, therefore doubling their talents. Both received a commendation from their master who stated, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I'm going to make you a ruler over many things. The servant who hid his talent rather than use it is rebuked by the master who announced, Thou wicked and slothful servant. Let me pause here and say I don't care what your excuse is, beloved, why you're not operating the gifts. When you stand before God, that's going to be his answer. 
you wicked and slothful servant. Oh, but God, but God, but God. Because of the servant's fear. See, fear and faith are diametrically opposed. Beloved, if you're in an atmosphere that can, is, is producing and conducive to fear, get out of that atmosphere. Get into an atmosphere of love and empowerment. Don't stay stuck in an atmosphere of religiosity and fear. Because of the servant's fear, he is reluctant to exercise and use the talents given him. This parable concludes with the unprofitable servant forfeiting his original talent to the servant who had proven his ability to use and double his five talents. And verse 29 puts a period with impact on this truth. For everyone that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. From him that hath not, it shall be taken away even that which he has. So beloved, you got to be a good steward of your gifting. It's time for you to, to pray and seek and ask God to help you be obedient and a good steward of the gifting he's given to you. God rewards risk done in faith, not reluctance. The whole counsel of God states in Romans 11 and 29, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Beloved, you can't fast and pray for a gifting and they decide because life is hard that you don't want to prophesy, that you don't want to be a prophet, that you don't want to operate in your gifting. Once God gives it to you, you are responsible to be a good steward of it. We are accountable in this life to use what is given to us. Because there will be, beloved, a day of reckoning. There will be a day of reckoning for me. And there will be a day of reckoning for you. And that's why I've been willing to obey God against all odds. Against all pain, all loss. That's why I'm here today teaching you. Because I'm going to stand before God and Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. God rewards risk. Done in faith, not reluctance. To the flesh and the mortal mind, we got to say, fry and die. Say that to yourself. Fry and die. For the flesh wars with the moving of the spirit. Beloved, God loves the fragrance of burning flesh. <laughs> you got to fry your flesh every day. It's the process of life. As we faithfully use the gifts God has given to us, we can expect an increase in ability, wisdom, and grace. Now here's a warning. If you fail to step out by faith, then you'll be considered a wicked and slothful servant. So another principle you can understand is don't be ignorant. Let me pause and say that's what, when your flesh is on the, on the altar, that's what brings the fire of God. So lay your flesh on the altar. Amen. Don't be ignorant. That's why I teach. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, Paul said it. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. There's a danger in being ignorant. Problem with most pastoral ministries at the hour, they want their saints ignorant. That's why pastors will tell people, oh, don't listen to that John Rocovio. He's in heresy. Because it's easier to blindly lead people that are ignorant. But once people start seeing the truth of God's word, then it creates challenges that many pastoral ministries are not willing to, 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 to face. There's a danger in being ignorant. In 1 Corinthians, the Holy Spirit is emphasizing that he not only wants the saints to hear about the gifts, but desires that they have a workable knowledge that has come from use. You gotta be skilled and have a workable knowledge from many years of stepping out by faith. Hosea 4 and 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Ignorance is defined as lacking or destitute of knowledge, information, comprehension, or education. Uninformed, or unaware, inexperienced, or unfamiliar. 
These last two are key words for the body of Christ has been kept from operating the gifts and they have not been given a place to express the gifts and therefore there is no validation. You know, when I was at that church recently, where after I stirred up that church and I challenged them and I said, you know what? The saints need to operate in the gifts. The pastor gets up and says, let's do what our Covio said, but I watched and everybody was like, uh, why? Because that's not normal. If that was normal, every service, everybody would have stepped out and started operating. God doesn't want you, pastor, just stirring people up because someone comes and lights a fire under you. you got to change your thinking and create an atmosphere for people to be able to express gifts. Because when you're not in an atmosphere where you can express your gifts, there is no validation of the gifts in your life. Therefore, the gifts become unfamiliar to you as a child of God. Because getting to know something comes through experience. If you're wanting to get to know someone in a friendship and you want that friendship to develop into something more, into a relationship, and to move from the philo dimension of friendship into the eros dimension of romantic love, you got to spend time with the person. That's all there is to it. It comes with experience. The word ignorant in the Greek is agneo, which means to ignore it doesn't necessarily mean to know by lack of information. It's by willingly ignoring. There are so many passages in the Bible that pastoral ministries in this hour and other ministers choose to ignore. You can come and challenge them with the scripture and they'll say, Oh, well, brother, that's just not the way we do things around here. So they want to hand you their organizational glasses and say, Okay, now I want you to read the word of God through these glasses, which tells you what's allowed and what's not allowed. So the Greek word here, agneo, means to ignore. Not to know by lack of information. Or not to understand. Not to have a workable and experiential knowledge. But the prophetic comes along and <sighs> blows the ashes off the living foundation of Jesus Christ and his eternal word. The flame of truth arises, forging new weapons. And saints of God are moved by the zeal of the Lord for his eternal plans and purposes, understanding that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. Beloved, obey God. Because there may be weapons formed against you, but honey, they won't prosper. God will stand for you. And God will honor you for obeying him and stepping out by faith and obedience and forgiveness. The apostolic prophetic breaks dead traditions and sets godly order and government within the ecclesia. There's an appreciation for our heritage, but there's a thrust to move forward. You know, I thank God for his history. I thank God for what happened 100 years ago. But I'm not going to stay stuck in that, in that move. I want to be in the move of God right now. I want to be in the tsunami wave of what God is doing right now. Thank God for our heritage, but we got to keep moving, buddy. Got to keep moving. Maturing is a process forward. It's not a stagnation. Maturing is not sitting still and stagnating. It's moving into present truths. Pioneers stay on the cutting edge of what God is saying, and other believers follow the breakthrough on the swelling wave that follows. Let's see. I'm probably going to have to... Uh, I think I can finish this. Let me just see how long I've been teaching now. Uh, I try to keep my sessions at an hour. Yeah, I've been teaching about an hour, so I'll go 31 minutes and I should be able to finish this session. Paul's guidelines were given to educate and direct, not to devalue and quench. If you're in the right atmosphere, the fivefold ministry is not going to devalue you concerning the gifts discourage you and quench those gifts in your life. But they're going to blow on the ashes. They're going to bring some Holy Ghost gas and pour it on your flame. The church at Corinth was having difficulties with the gifts of the Spirit. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, didn't shut things down. He simply brought divine order. And that's what apostles do. They bring divine order. To emphasize the Lord's desire for his people to continue manifesting in the gifts... Paul concluded chapter 12 with covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Chapter 13 
or the great love chapter, shows that a knowledge of the gifts is not enough. There must be higher and more holy motives of divine love. Paul concludes that the guidelines that continue through chapter 14 with this powerful statement. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. What does it mean for let all things be done decently in order? That's not control and manipulation. Too many people think that, that preaching that, that all things must be done in decent order means to put forth a, a wet blanket of fear and intimidation. No, it just means teach people correctly. If they're doing it wrong, teach them right with the spirit of a father in gentleness. These guidelines are meant to construct, not constrict, or hinder believers. On the contrary, Paul admonishes them to covet to prophesy. Paul's guidelines help the Christians to overcome ignorance of the spiritual gifts just as he did in 1 Corinthians 11 with the difficulties they were having with Holy Communion. He never told them to stop having communion. He said, quit doing it incorrectly. We all have forfeited, let all things be done. Remember that. The decent in order is preceded by let all things be done. Don't be so concentrated on decently in order that you forget to let all things be done. Many of those concerned about wildfires douse all fires. Fearing extremes, we've neglected to encourage a regular manifestation of the gifts that edify, exhort, and build up the body amongst the believers. The apostolic thrust enhances the gifts and gives structure, decency, and order. The most difficult part in getting things to be done is understanding the decency and order part. So the encouragement to do is primary. And the building of accuracy is molded while you're doing. So getting knowledge is the beginning of manifesting gifts by faith. Romans 12 and 6 tells us, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, or the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Once again, faith is what activates prophetic words. Give information. Feed my sheep. Eat the word. See, before a believer can manifest anything by faith, that believer must first come to knowledge of the truth from the teaching of the Logos. So it's not just going out and saying, okay, everybody, come on. We're going to pray in tongues and just operate. There's got to be teaching. You've got to ground people in the word so they can operate in decency and order and do it correctly according to the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, Romans 10 and 17. Now note that the manifestations of the gift of prophecy is in direct proportion to the faith of the giver. James 2 and 17 reminds us that faith without the corresponding action is dead. So we're without excuse. Take your faith and mix it with works. The natural progression is knowing, believing, receiving, and then activating and manifesting, manifesting the gift by faith. Just as, just as in salvation, so it is in the operation of the gifts. Scripture plainly reveals that God does not want his church to lack a workable and experiential knowledge of his gifts. The Berean model is revelation, validation, and application. Again, the Berean model is revelation, validation, and activation. So, we're admonished to neglect not the gifts. That's 1 Timothy 4 and 14. Neglect not the gift that's in thee, which is given thee by prophecy with the laying on the hands of the presbytery. This is a spiritual command, beloved. Sila. Christ realized that the church would need the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit in order to obtain the so great salvation. Regardless, regarding the giftings of the Holy Spirit as precious and of most high value. Hebrews 2 through 4 warns us, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the very first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard them? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders 
and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, Timothy had a problem not unlike many of us have in this day and hour. Timothy had a fear of man. Still, the command was given to him, neglect not the gifts. So just as Timothy was, beloved, we are required to press in and operate in our giftings. I have a question for you. How much do you want the kingdom of God in you? It is answered by how much of the traditions of men and religious order are you willing to be stripped from you? God wants us to run this race and press towards the mark of our high calling. You'll either run the race or the race will run you. Not only should we neglect not, we should despise not. Paul also said, quench not the spirit and despise not prophesyings. 1 Corinthians, Thessalonians 5, 19-20, Paul confronts and gives a Holy Spirit command. Apparently, there was a number of believers who began to quench the gifts of the Spirit and were beginning to despise the spiritual gifts of prophecy. Now, many times this happens when there's misuse and abuse of gifts, but don't be cynical. Just don't, don't look at people that failed and, and mess up. Get around people that are doing it right. Despise in the Greek is exodino, which means to make utterly nothing of, to discount, to dismiss. Oh, how many religious orders do this? Completely dismiss the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. They were not giving the, the gifts their proper place or order and giving prophecy a lesser esteem than what God commanded them. We are commanded to grant the gifts of the Spirit their proper place and importance in ecclesia life. We cannot have an attitude of take it or leave it and shrug off what God values. Christ commands his church to despise not. Not only should we not despise the giftings in ministry, but we must become addicted to it. Think about things in your life you get addicted to. It means every day you do them. Some things are good, some things are not good. I thank God for an addiction to prayer every day. I thank God for an addiction to the Word of God every day. I need to slow my coffee down that I drink every day. <laughs> that may not be a good addiction. But 1 Corinthians 16 and 15 tells us, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That means every day they look for opportunities to operate in their giftings. That's why we have Apostolic Centers launch, because it's opportunities to operate every day in every area of society. This household served in natural ways, but also by the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They gained good reputation with Paul as being people addicted to serving God's saints. What better way to serve one another than to minister healing in the fellowship over a cup of coffee? You invite someone over for dinner and you minister gifts to them. I appreciate so much Prophet Jennifer Osmond because she's always looking for places just to, to deliver God's word. And I've discovered with this wonderful woman of God that she has been shunned, kicked out of churches, ridiculed, mocked, but it doesn't stop her. That woman's got boldness, and every day she's telling me words God's given to her. And I thank God that she's per persevered and pressed through. And I thank God I've had the opportunity for almost two years now to mentor her personally and to work with her because she is a wonderful, wonderful woman of God. So what better way to serve one another than to minister healing in the fellowship or to comfort with prophecy or to bring deliverance with the gift of faith and discerning of spirits or to show a way with the word of wisdom? This is the true church in operation, not spectators, but participators. Our goal should be to serve the corporate body, to share, to encourage with a now testimony to pump up and become servants, always ready to minister one to another. The episodic pattern is servanthood in spiritual dimensions. Stepping out and putting oneself on the line, 
not fearing faces, but trusting God is accurate. These saints craved the opportunity to serve because they knew God's will was to minister. The apostolic prophetic and the saints movement brings us an anointing to awaken, to teach, to train, and to release a new thrust of the Holy Spirit. Preaching is not a Sunday matinee that takes place over a pulpit by one person, but a living demonstration of our own living God, reaching out to meet the needs of his own. Ministry means having the expectation that every day of the week, the kingdom will manifest with greater works. Jesus proclaimed to his church to fulfill all his plan and purposes on the earth. So my challenge to you, beloved, is get addicted to ministry. Look for ways to minister every single day in every setting you can. We must manifest membership ministry. 1 Corinthians 12 and 27 says, Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Every saint of God has a membership ministry. In verses 12 to 27, Paul's concise lecture communicates the necessity that the many members of the church must work together. God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him, verse 18 tells us. As a body of individual members with gifts differing according to the grace given, Romans 12, 12 and 6 tells us, every believer is commanded to fulfill his or her, her individual membership ministry without division, without partiality, and certainly without a spirit of competition coming in. Because we're not competing against each other. We're complementing each other. And we're working together hand in hand to serve the kingdom of God. And that goes for the fivefold ministry. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. To join hands in unity in honor, loving and preferring one another to serve the body of Christ. To awaken, to align and to activate them into significant ministries. We're commanded to minister one to another. 1 Peter 4 and 10 says, As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The NIV version says it this way, Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Manifesting the gifts brings edification and growth. Ephesians 4 and 16 tells us, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body on the edifying of itself in love. As individual members of the body of Christ manifest their spiritual gifts, they supply the body's needs, bringing forth a healthy, growing body. So, beloved, it's time to get going. It's time for you to operate in your gift. Covet, desire, stir up, exercise, don't be ignorant, neglect not, despise not, be addicted to, and minister in the gifts of the Spirit. I encourage you at the... Um, at the end of your, your uh, workbook that you have, if you'll go to section 413, take some time tonight after this teaching, while the teaching is fresh, and go through the questions where it talks about list three points that stood out to you in this particular teaching and things of this nature. And so just to kind of give you a recap real quick, so if you just want to go to the very end of this teaching and see the recap, you'll be able to go through and answer all um, 11 questions and uh, be able to um, know it. So what I taught today is I taught you to cover earnestly, to be tremendously and passionately zealous. Gifts were not designed to, to benefit us directly, to desire spiritual gifts. Desire is a spiritual key to receiving. Becoming soft and pliable in your wineskin. I've talked about stirring up your spiritual gift. I've talked about how the believer has responsibility to stir up. How the stirring is based on the individual will. I've talked about how the gifts are stirred up. 
talked about it being exercised by use. It's by reason of use that believers develop their spiritual senses. Our ability to hear is eternal, has eternal consequences. The parable of stewardship reveals our individual responsibilities. I taught about not being ignorant, the danger of being ignorant. Paul's guidelines were, being, were given to educate, direct, not devalue or quench. Let all things be done decently in order. I talked about gaining knowledge as the beginning of manifest, manifesting the gifts of faith. I talked about neglecting not, don't make light of the gifts, despise not, become addicted to it, so just do it. I talked about manifesting membership ministry. I talked about every saint has a membership ministry. I talked about commanding to minister to one another. And manifesting the gift brings edification and growth. So God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us in our, our time of teaching. And I pray that you will stir your gift up and you'll follow the process of allowing God to flow through you in the gifting. Next week, we'll be covering on session five, Ministering the Mind of Christ. God bless you. I love you. This is John Arcovio. I serve as an apostle. I pray this is a great blessing to you. And may God richly bless and use you in the gifts of the Spirit. Have a wonderful evening. And Lord willing, we will see you next Tuesday for another exciting time of teaching. May God bless you.